Okay, so please go. I think you're muted. Do you hear me now? Yes, now I hear Nuria. Okay, good. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor David Croydon uh, from Kyoto. Uh, so his title is Invariant Measures of KDV and Total Type Discrete Integral System. So please start. Okay, well, thanks uh, for the uh, invitation to, to give a talk in this uh, uh, seminar series. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, KDV and total type discrete integrable systems. And so maybe just from the beginning, I should highlight, I'm not really an expert in integral systems. So probably some people in the audience will know uh, much more about these kind of systems um, than I do. So, well, hopefully anyway, what I say will not be too basic um, for them uh, come the end. But uh, anyway, if you don't know about these systems already, on the other hand, I should say that um, I'm going to be starting from the basics because that's pretty much <laughs> all I know about the, the, the systems. And so, um, yeah, that's where, where, where I am. Um, so rather what my interest is in uh, these systems or has been over the last uh, couple of years has been more from a, a probabilistic point of view. So I'm working in uh, probability theory. And what I hope to explain today are some of the results that have come out of um, starting to think about these systems um, when they've been started from uh, random initial conditions. And so this is the sort of general uh, setting in which um, I've been working. Okay, and so, um, yeah, when I say I uh, actually, all of the uh, new results that I talk, to talk about today are all kind of joint and they're joint with uh, Makiko Sasada, who's in um, Tokyo University and, um, or University of Tokyo and uh, Satoshi Sujimoto, who's, uh, here with me in uh, Kyoto University. And so, um, yeah, if I forget to mention them again, then um, like I say, all the new results are, are joint with them. Okay, so like I say, just in case um, uh, people aren't familiar with the systems, I thought I'd start with uh, a bit of brief, brief background um, <clears throat> to these, just to make sure that we're all on, on the same page. And actually, before I get to the discrete versions of the systems, I'll just spend a minute or two uh, remembering some of the motivation for studying these. So uh, just to sort of go back to the beginning of, of the KDV and uh, the total lattice equations. So these are the, the basic equations here and, and here. And so, well, the KDV equation is just this, this PDE, of course, that's, that's used to describe um, uh, shallow water waves. So in particular, like in this picture here, we might drop a, a weight or something into some narrow canal and it generates some, some waveform that might drift off at like a constant speed here. So this is a soliton for the system um, in, in this setting. Um, and the total lattice equation is, is this kind of coupled system of equations here. So P will be the momentum and Q will be the um, displacement here of um, maybe the nth particle here in um, what's meant to be a one dimensional uh, crystal here. And so this is kind of a, a set of equations arising in uh, solid state physics. And so although these are a priori not particularly uh, related, um, one thing that connects them is that they both indeed exhibit these kind of soliton solutions. Um, so um, yeah, just to reiterate, so soliton here is, is, is a traveling wave. So um, it's just kind of a waveform here that sort of maintains its shape under the dynamics and drifts off at some, some constant speed like this. So um, this would be a solution of, of this equation. And so sort of maybe more importantly, these solitons act a bit like particles. So you can define, for example, multiple soliton solutions. So here might be um, a two soliton solution. You've got a large one here and a small one here. And the large one here is kind of interacting and uh, overtaking the smaller one. Um, but after the interaction, they kind of recover more or less their initial uh, shape and, and move off more or less independently here. And so this is uh, an important aspect of the study um, of, of the KDB equation. And yeah, maybe just from the point of view of um, uh, probability kind of uh, theory, maybe a, a nice new result just to highlight um, in this area. There was a, a paper, I think, uh, available last year or two um, by Killip, Murphy and Dazan, who, who exactly study the KDV equation, started, started from, well, actually a very rough initial condition. So maybe white, white noise. Um, 
And they show exactly using kind of a decomposition into some kind of soup of solitons. So um, it's quite a complicated picture. They, they use this to show the invariance of this, this kind of uh, random initial configuration. And although this is um, not rigorously connected to what I talk about, um, uh, today, in, in, in essence, it's kind of uh, quite closely related to, to, the, uh, to, to the questions that I talk about for sort of the related discrete integral systems. And so I thought I'd just mention that at uh, this point. Um, yeah, so this is a sort of, uh, sort of large scale background of, of, of what we're studying. Actually, the, the kind of soliton picture in the KDB equation, as I'm sure many people here know, is, is quite, uh, quite uh, complicated. And difficult to understand um, directly, and so to um, start thinking about a sort of simpler version of a soliton system. So sort of in in 1990, Takahashi and Satsuma introduced kind of a, a simpler discrete time, discrete space uh, deterministic uh, dy dynamical system in order to to try and capture similar solitonic behavior to try and um, well. Yeah, to, to give um, a, a system with, with a similar kind of kind of behavior. And so, so what the system was, was the box ball system. So, so the configurations here are just um, strings of zeros and ones. So zeros here are going to represent sort of empty boxes. Balls are going to be represented by um, ones here. So a, a box with a ball in, sorry, is, is a one. So these, these yellow blobs in, the, in this picture. And what the dynamics are is that on each um, time step, each ball is going to move exactly once. And the way in which it does this is we go along, say, from left to right. So I should say at the moment, I'm just going to think about a finite number of balls in the picture. And so I can choose a leftmost one. And I'm going to move that just to the nearest empty space on, on its right. So I just go from two to three here. I then go along. And find the next leftmost ball. So this was the one in box four there. And I move that one along to its next space. So that's going to be number seven there. And so on. So five here uh, looks along. And because seven was already taken, we have to move five all the way down this yellow arc down to, to number nine. And, and so on. And so um, the arcs here show, show the sort of steps taken by each of the balls and the, the sort of subsequent picture that we get when we move the balls along each of these arcs is, is, is shown shown down here. And this is one time step of the, the dynamics for this, this system. And maybe slightly more opaquely, here's kind of a, a mathematical way to, to write this down. So um, the dynamics, which I'll denote by capital T here, um, gives a new configuration. And basically what this formula says is to, to end up with a, a ball, ball sorry, in, in the box after one time step of the dynamics, we need an, an empty box there before. And we need at least one of these arcs to cross into this um, to this space, and so that's what this kind of infinite sum is is capturing there. Um, and yeah, so this this kind of picture, of course, works for the the finite um, case. And um, just to sort of start off the uh, the picture here, we need to kind of assume that we've got sort of no particles to the left of where we had particles uh, originally, and so that means that this infinite sum. It's just kind of zero, you know. All the terms in this infinite sum are zero beyond beyond some point, and so it kind of makes sense. So yeah, being a probabilist, of course, when I see kind of zeros and ones, what I want to do is um, like this: is, is is make them random, um, and ask what happens if we put in a random initial con configuration here. How does that sort of um, uh, evolve under the dynamics of the box ball system. So namely, if I, if I put some measure, probability measure on the particles here, what's the probability measure after one time step of the dynamics? And of course, a very natural question to ask is what kind of probability measures can I put on the top line here, such that if I run the dynamics for one time step, are they invariant? So maybe after one time step of the dynamics, does the, the distribution of the particles look the same as what I I started with. And so this is the sort of basic question of today's talk. And you can kind of immediately see a problem here in that each of these balls is moving off at least one step to the right here. And so in some sense, the system is, is, is transient. So all the particles are kind of drifting out to the right here as we kind of evolve it. 
And so to hope to see something that's invariant um, here, we're either going to need to kind of keep on adding in particles kind of at, at position zero here, or perhaps kind of extending the configuration to, to sort of a, one that has an infinite number of balls going back to minus infinity. So that sort of as the dynamics kind of push particles to the right, we kind of keep on adding in particles, new particles keep on kind of appearing um, from the left here. Okay, and so that gives us a chance to, to see invariant um, probability measures. And so you can kind of already see that in some sense, um, this is already a problem because at least in this description of the dynamics, even then describing the dynamics becomes a, a question that we have to, to consider. So in particular, we have a bi-infinite configuration here. We, we can't off start off by, by talking about the leftmost ball. And so we have to start off by thinking, um, how, how else can we kind of describe the dynamics in a, in a natural way um, that kind of matches this, this picture described by Takashi and, and Satsuma. So this is going to be one of the, uh, the main problems I talk about. And actually the, the main part of the talk will be describing how we, we dealt with that, that problem. Okay, so towards doing that, um, <coughs> it turns out that there's another kind of useful um, description of the box ball dynamics. And so um, this goes back um, uh, much earlier than our work. And yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't um, include a citation maybe where the, the carrier for the box ball system was was, was introduced, but um, here's, here's how it works. So again, we'll start with the same configuration that we started with um, on the previous uh, page here. And what we're going to think about the carrier is maybe like a little lorry here, he's driving along. And when he sees a ball like this, he's gonna pick it up. And when he sees a space like this, he's gonna put the ball down. So if he's carrying a ball, he'll put it down and so on. So here he's gonna pass three balls and he's going to pick them all up. There wasn't any spaces in between. And so at this point, he's got three, three balls and then he kind of puts them down um, when he can and so on. And so when you kind of follow down the whole picture, this is the, um, uh, the resulting configuration. And what you can check is once this carrier has made one complete pass here from, from left to right. So again, I, I just state this for a finite configuration. Um, once he's made one complete pass from left to right, then, then the, the configuration we see down here is just the same in fact as the one that we described on the, the previous page. Okay, and so again, we can write this down mathematically and um, in particular, a kind of useful way to do this is to sort of introduce a new um, uh, process. So this is the so-called carrier process and I'll denote this in this talk with you. And so UN is just going to represent the number of balls carried from some site to the next site. So here it's kind of maybe one here, zero here, one here, two here, three here, and, and so on. And you can kind of easily check the rules for updating this. So if there's a ball, the carrier um, goes up by one. If there's a space and it's carrying at least one particle, then it, it goes down by one. Otherwise it just stays at, at zero. It's actually what you can check is that um, in the finite particle case, actually this U is just playing the role of this, this infinite sum um, down here. And so the dynamics of the system then are just described um, through this formula here, where we just replace the, the infinite sum by this, this UN minus one, one here. And so what the problem has become, if we're kind of going to want to extend this to an infinite dynamics, um, if we want to extend this picture here is, is whether we can find, um, given an initial configuration, infinite configuration, whether we can find a process that sort of satisfies all of these constraints kind of locally. And then if that, that does exist, then we can just then use this as a definition of the dynamics um, given the carrier. And so that's the, the approach that we're going to take. And so there's, as with all kind of initial value problems, um, kind of infinite initial value problems like this, there's kind of two basic questions that you can ask. The first is sort of whether this carrier even exists. Um, and if it does exist, is it unique? Because of course we want somehow the dynamics to be defined uniquely in some way. And so that's of course an important question to consider um, as well. Um, yeah, so just to um, expand the picture a little bit. So if I'm talking about invariant measures, I'm not necessarily going to just want to run the dynamics for one step. I might want to kind of iterate the process and generate a whole sequence of, of configurations. So actually, um, what the basic picture I'm going to have is, is kind of kind of sketched um, sketched down here. So in particular, what let's suppose I, I know the configuration at time t. So this is going to be my 
my eta n. So this is going to be the current configuration. The basic problem is, can I find a carrier for, the, for this process? So, so namely a process that's kind of consistent with this sequence of equations for that particular configuration. And well, then use that to define the dynamics. So I get the configuration after one time step. Um, and can I kind of do this for, for all time? Okay, so what kind of configurations will, will allow me to do that? And what kind of choice of carrier will allow me to do that? And so this is um, the question we'll be, be thinking about. And yeah, so I, like I said, I can locally draw the, the dynamics in terms of these kind of lattice equations. So in particular, if I know the, um, the current configuration and the carrier, the number of balls carried to this location by the carrier, then I also know the number of balls taken away by the carrier and, and the number of new balls in, in this site. And so this kind of uh, little black box here, this, this um, involution, in fact, um, is given in the case of, a, of the box ball system just by these, these equations here. OK, and so, um, yeah, for those people that work in this area, they'll know that this is this sort of set of equations is, is what's known as a version of the uh, ultra discrete uh, KDV equation. And I've included here sort of these superscripts, one and infinity. So the one is just um, reflecting the fact that in the model I talked about so far, I only allow one ball in each box, but more generally, I might generalize to um, just J, some, some natural number of balls, or even have, allow an infinite number of balls in each box. And I also, in the model that I described, I, I allow the carrier to carry an arbitrarily large number of balls. So, so it's got kind of an infinite capacity. But again, more generally, you can easily imagine that in this kind of picture here, you might want to place an upper limit on the number of balls that this um, carrier can carry, in which case um, we can also build this into the model. It will affect the, the equations. And I'll write down the, the formula later for this. Um, but this is going to be um, denoted by K in, in this talk, this, this cap capacity of the, the carrier here. OK. so. Um, yeah, this is the, the sort of basic model and, and notation for, for the talk. Um, yeah, and like I say, so these are the sort of two main problems that I'm going to talk about. So firstly, I, I want to talk about the initial value problem. So maybe given a configuration, in what sense the sort of the, the forward um, time uh, solutions to the initial value problem exist, and in what sense are these uh, unique? Um, so I'm going to do that for the ultra discrete KDV equation. So this includes the box ball system. And I'm also going to do it for uh, related systems. Um, and once I've, I've constructed these kind of uh, solutions, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the, the invariant measures. And actually, this turns out once we've constructed the solutions to be, a, at least from the point of view of probability theory, a, a kind of an easier question to, to deal with. Um, and so I'll spend the last bit of the talk uh, talking about that. Um, yeah, I should say, from the point of view of kind of studying these systems from random initial conditions, there's been various other uh, works in, in, in recent years um, of studying this. So um, actually a very nice work by Ferrari and Gruen, Rollo and Wang um, constructs actually a richer class than I'll talk about today, at least for the box ball system of invariant measures. And somehow from the point of view of integral systems, these are very natural in that they're, they're based on um, a natural soliton decomposition of um, infinite configurations. And so um, yeah, this is a, a very nice, nice result, which unfortunately I probably won't have time to talk about today. Um, yeah, maybe just for those not familiar. So solitons in the, the box ball system are just kind of strings of consecutive ones and, and zeros. And so you can see in isolation, these are just going to move um, at the speed equal to their length. So this kind of three soliton moves at speed three. We've got one soliton here moving at speed one. They'll interact and just like solitons in the the KDV equation, they kind of interact, but they kind of also are preserved, conserved quantities, so they're kind of recovered um, after the interactions uh, like this. And so, yeah, it's kind of a very natural uh, uh, way to decompose the configurations and to study invariant measures. So this is a, a very nice story um, here. And yeah, I see, uh, and so Kniba is in the audience here. And so actually another direction. So this is kind of in um, the equilibrium state for the system. Of course, you can also think about starting the system from random configurations out of equilibrium. And in recent years, um, uh, again, there's been a, a couple of works in this direction. So one by me and uh, Marco Sasada, and one by Kaniba, Miskic, and Pache, or a couple, I should say, by, by them, where they 
uh, study generalized hydrodynamic limits. And so this is exactly exploring the, the, the nature of the system when we start it from some out of equilibrium um, uh, uh, situation and sort of exploring how the, the densities of the various soliton sizes evolve um, under the dynamics of the system. And again, that's kind of a very nice and interesting story, but uh, maybe one that I won't have time uh, to talk about today. Um, although I think, yeah, actually you're looking at the uh, uh, past records of this seminar. Maybe you had a, a seminar from uh, Kniba Sente on this last year, so maybe I don't need to talk about it. Uh, anyway, uh, at least his part <laughs> of the story. Um, so yeah, just to kind of broaden out the picture a bit. So, so far I just talked about the box ball system and this will be my main example today. Um, actually the, the sort of techniques that um, I talk about also turn out to be um, applicable uh, more widely than this. So just, this is really just a, a sketch to kind of highlight that there's um, a number of other systems that are gonna be covered by the, the same techniques. And so at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned the KDV and the total lattice equations. And so there's um, natural discretizations of these called the discrete KDV and discrete total equation. Um, and well, these are related to um, ultra discrete versions by um, the procedure of ultra discretization that maybe um, some of you are familiar with. And the box ball system just appears in this picture as a special case of the, the ultra discrete KDV equation and, and can also be interpreted as um, through the, the ultra discrete total e equation too. And so actually all I talk about today will, will apply to all of these kind of systems related up to these um, continuous systems um, that, that kind of I started with. Um, yeah, and just, I mean, like I say, I won't talk about these other systems in, in detail today, just as kind of a reminder for people that know about them. And well, if you don't know about them, just as a very, very brief introduction, here's the kind of um, difference to what I talked about earlier. So, so like I say, the box ball system was a version of the ultra discrete KDV equation where J was equal to one and K was equal to infinity. More generally, the, the equations look a bit, um, well, they look like this. So the lattice structure is essentially the same. We can, uh, Define sort of current configuration and some sort of carrier, and they're related through, through these equations. And yeah, we don't have to consider just integer valued variables. So in the story that I talk about, I'll also be able to include kind of um, just general R valued variables here and just R valued capacities and, and for, the, for the boxes and the carrier here. And yeah, I should say that also, um, although I won't talk about it today, there, there's kind of multi colored versions of these systems. Where you're thinking that you've got particles of, of different types, perhaps. Um, and again, you can ask similar kind of questions to what I ask about today. So, kind of invariant measures for these um, systems. And, and, and this is work that's, that's um, at least been started um, in various settings. And so, um, there are results um, in that direction for these kind of systems. But, uh, like I say, I won't have time to, to talk about those today. Um, so yeah, the discrete KDV equation looks something like this. Again, the sort of structure of the lattice is, is the same. And we've got sort of a configuration input, some kind of carrier process input, and we can um, uh, express the dynamics this time in terms of rational functions um, like this. And again, for people that know, you'll know that the ultra discrete KDV is just obtained through this kind of suitable exponential or sort of zero temperature limit um, here of, of the variables. And so that's the connection. Uh, with the box ball system. Um, yeah, on the other hand, um, again, it looks a little bit different at first. I mean, it's the ultra discrete K to total equation, sorry. And so in this case, my configuration is going to sort of have two kinds of variables. And my carrier here is, is the variable along here. And sort of locally, my lattice is going to have this kind of structure. So over here, and, and the dynamics are described um, in this way. And Again, if you haven't seen it before, this relates to the box ball system. So kind of the, the way to think about these variables here is that rather than kind of encoding the big configuration as kind of ones and zeros as per its kind of spatial location, I just kind of group these up so that I just count the number of consecutive balls or consecutive um, spaces here. So maybe this configuration here is encoded in, in this sense here. So the Q variables are gonna be the balls, the E variables are gonna be the spaces. I've got kind of three balls, two spaces, and, and so on. And what these kind of local dynamics here are doing are describing the evolution of, of this picture over time. And so 
the box ball dynamics, you can see are kind of taking this configuration down to here, and the TODA dynamics are taking this kind of um, rewriting of the configuration down to this this rewriting of this this same configuration down here. Um, and so this is the the kind of connection again with the, the box ball system. And again, there's a kind of discrete version that sort of sits above this. Um, so the sort of lattice structure is the same. The local dynamics again is in, in terms of rational functions like this. And again, we get back down to the ultra discrete version through through some suitable limiting um, operation. So probably, I guess I'm not teaching any, anybody anything particularly new if you know about these things already. And if you don't, maybe it's a bit fast, but the point is there's this kind of system, this, this kind of world of different systems that um, we're going to be able to deal with in a, in a similar way. Okay, so this goes back to just the picture. And again, just to kind of relate a bit to the kind of uh, recent work in the probability theory in kind of related areas, maybe a kind of a nice result um, of recent years was um, one of Castell and Remenick. So they, they recently connected uh, the so-called Kada Prizizang fixed point, so the KPZ fixed point, um, which is a particular, um, um, let's say, stochastic differential equation arising in the study of st st stochastic integral systems. Um, and they've related this to the to the KP equation. And so, of course, again, for people in integral systems, you're no doubt familiar with how this is a, a higher dimensional version of, um, uh, of the KDV equation. Um, and so this is kind of quite an uh, interesting connection, I would say, between um, this kind of... Uh, hello, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you. There is a question on the chat. So, okay, so, yeah, let's go back. So, yeah, so, okay, so the question was, uh, yeah, what interval system? What definition interval do I take? So, I mean, I guess the short answer is I don't take a definition of integral. So, if there's any controversy around this uh, area, then I'm not going to be involved in, in this. Uh, uh, I guess if you want kind of background on, on the kind of integral uh, structures associated with the box ball system, there's a very nice survey by, uh, well, Ray and her collaborators, so Kaniba and Takagi. So, maybe if you, you want some background in this direction, this is a good, good place to start. Uh, about reading about these things. So yeah, maybe my answer wasn't very good <laughs> for the question, but uh, yeah, there's better <laughs> answer uh, in this paper than I can give, I think. Um, but yeah, so from the point of view of today's talk, you don't really need to understand anything about the system and what, what I've described. So mainly we have a, it just, we have a sequence of, of lattice uh, variables or a collection of lattice variables that are, are related through this, this system of equations. And yeah, the conserved quantities for this system are going to be kind of soliton type, um, uh, quantities, I should say. Um, but again, that's not important for, for today's talk. Um, for today's talk, um, yeah, uh, what what do we need? So, so what my basic question is is, like I say, we we want to um, start these these um, systems from some kind of infinite. Um, um, a configuration. So typically in the literature, the kind of configurations that would be considered would be either kind of finite ones or, or periodic ones or ones with a very nice kind of uh, boundary condition. So maybe the, these kind of variables converge to something at the boundary. But this is what we want to, to avoid. We want to kind of describe some kind of more general approach to describing how the evolution occurs from some um, more general class of um, infinite solutions. And so um, in particular, um, what our uh, construction is going to be based on is, is a certain uh, way of, of, of writing down the, the dynamics in terms of a collection of or a family of, of, of path encodings for the um, for the configuration. So this is something I'll introduce in, a, in the next slide or two. Um, and yeah, this this is going to relate very nicely to a, a kind of classical area of, of probability theory, and so it gives a very nice route into to studying the invariant measures of the various processes. And so that's what will be the last few minutes of the, the talk describing that. Um, so yeah, just as a reminder, of the problem. So we've got sort of our infinite by infinite configuration here. We can't use the sort of uh, sort of formal expression given kind of individual paper for for defining the dynamics for this. 
instead we're going to kind of be looking for a carrier process and so we want to, to to explore is there a process satisfying this kind of recursive equation and if so then then we can define the dynamics using that and we want to know about the, the uniqueness of this so this is our problem um, here and here's the sort of in a sense the, the kind of key takeaway slide but for the talk as to how, how we do that. Um, and so, yeah, so here's our configuration. So again, just to begin with, I'll, I'll talk about finite configurations, but you can not, you'll already be able to see from this slide that it's gonna be very easy to extend this picture to, to infinite configurations, or at least a suitable class of them. And so I'm gonna write this down in terms of a simple random walk path. Um, so um, in particular, I'm going to have an up step here for every um, gap in the configuration and a down step for every particle, this. And so you, you're kind of mapping this configuration to this the, the black path on the bottom there. And so this is my, my path S. And what I want to do is to, to define a carrier for this, this process, right? And so let's think how the carrier would behave on this finite configuration. It's going to come along. It's going to pick up these first two particles, like on this blue line here. It's going to put down one of the particles in that space and so on. And so it's going to be this, this blue curve here. And so you can see kind of from to connect from this, this black path to this blue path is actually quite straightforward. So in particular, you can see whenever we pick up a particle, whenever we see a particle, sorry, the, the S path here has a down step. And so I'm going to map that to an up step of the, the blue path here. And similarly, when, when we're putting down a particle um, here, um, so when we see a space here, we're putting down a particle. So that's an up step of the, um, the S path. This is mapped to the down step here. But at some point, and in particular this point here, so maybe I can annotate the picture. So at this point here, then actually what you can see is at this point, we picked up five particles and there's been five spaces to put down particles. And that's exactly at the point where um, this S path is equal to its, its past maximum. So I'm using M here to, to represent the past maximum. And on this picture, that's the, the red curve here. And you can see that if I then have a space, then of course the carrier is carrying nothing and it's passing a space. So it just stays on, on zero here. And so this is this flat part of the carrier and, and, and so on. And so actually it's kind of a easy induction exercise to check that actually this means that you can easily describe this, this carrier path from, from the, the path encoding here in the following way. So in particular, it's just exactly this difference um, between the maximum and the S. So in particular, the U is just, this blue path is just this difference um, between the red line and, and the black line um, down there. Okay, so that's the, um, the carrier process of the original configuration, but we can also think about the dynamics. And if you think about the carrier, each time it's picking up particles, it's got an up step. So here are particles on all these up steps here. And where it's putting down particles are just on all these down steps. So these ones here. So these are the places where it's putting down particles. And so essentially, in terms of the path coding, all we're going to want to do is just swap all of these around. So all of the the, the, the increments that were kind of down before should now be up and, and vice versa. And so within these kind of excursions, so within kind of periods where the carrier is kind of carrying particles, we just kind of flip the, the picture around. So in particular, we flip this, this part of the configuration up and on the sort of flat bits, we do nothing. I mean, it's still an empty space. So the path should still jump up one like this. And so, yeah, maybe this was a slightly long-winded way to say, but essentially what this means is we're just reflecting this black line in the red line. And so in particular, that's just um, the new, new path that we're gonna get. When we do that, it's just this 2M um, minus S here. And so this is gonna be the new path, um, or, or sorry, the path um, related to the new configuration. And well, I include this um, centering here. So this is just a constant to make sure that this new path passes through zero in case that I had particles on the, the left of the origin, maybe the, the maximum at zero wasn't going to be um, zero. Okay, so this is the, um, um, the way in which we can kind of, or a way in which we can describe the dynamics using this kind of path, path encoding. Just this simple operation on, on paths turns out to exactly capture the, 
um, to what's called um, system dynamics. So. And well, maybe just as a slightly larger picture, here's kind of the black line at the bottom there is, is kind of a configuration just generated randomly. So just putting particles in at uh, this density here. And the blue path is the kind of new configuration that we just get by reflecting in the, the past maximum line. And on the right here, I've just got the, the associated carrier process. And so again, for people that know about box ball systems, you'll kind of understand that the solitons in this system um, are kind of given by the peaks of the carrier in some sense. And so we can kind of see how the solitons are kind of moving under the dynamics here. So actually this one's moving um, from here to here um, under the dynamics and so on. Okay, so that's the basic picture. So yeah, maybe I'm going a little bit slower than I hoped, but um, anyway, just to kind of connect back to, to probability theory. So, so this transformation is actually very well known in probability theory, this kind of reflection in the past maximum. And it's what's known as uh, Pittman's transformation. And so sort of famously by at least a probabilist, it was shown by, by Pittman that, for example, if we start with a, a Brown in motion, just something like this, and we, we kind of do the same transformation. So we, we, we draw the past maximum. So maybe I should have used the same colors, but let's draw the past maximum in, in black here. And I, and I, I do the Pittman's transformation, so I reflect in this past maximum, something like this, maybe. <laughs> then the new process that I constructed is, of course, now a positive process. And um, actually, this is has, has a particular name, the, the Bessel process in, in probability. So this was a, a nice way for probabilists to construct this, this Bessel process. So that was the reason why Pittman started thinking about this, this transformation. But it has other nice um, properties. So for example, if I started with a two-sided Brown emission, so Let's take a brown in motion with a drift upwards, so something like this, and I run the Pittman transformation. So again, I, 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 I take the past maximum of this process, and I do the reflection. So I now get some process that lives above this, this black line. Then it turns out that this process is just another brown in motion, at least when I've recentered um, at the origin. Um, then this is just another brown in motion with, with the same drift, and so that was another kind of. Um, uh, insight from, from probability theory here. Um, so, um, yeah, there's kind of a, maybe a natural question to ask is kind of why um, why this kind of um, transformation appeared in, in the kind of world of integral systems, and in particular in, in this kind of box ball system. And actually, it turns out that when you kind of write things down in, in the right way, um, it turns out to be a nat very natural equation to to come out when you've expressed the, the configuration as the path encoding as we have done. And in particular, it turns out that it's just equivalent to, to the formula here. So this is just, so the number of particles at the current location and the number of particles bought by the carrier. And this is the number of particles taken away by the carrier and the particles left by the carrier. So this is just kind of a conservation of mass formula. And this exactly explains why um, um, Pittman's transformation appears. Um, in this setting. And actually, this is also the kind of insight that, that meant we were able to generalize this to other kinds of um, discrete integral systems. So if you're kind of asking in your head, like, um, why should I care about this path encoding more generally, then actually the next couple of slides will hopefully give a bit of an answer to that in that they give a bit of a clue as to why we expect that this might hold in, in other kinds of systems um, or be useful in other kinds of systems. Um, and so just to kind of go through the systems that I wrote down at the <coughs> in, in the first part of the talk. So, so it turns out for the other integral systems, um, we can write down a path encoding in, in some suitable way. We can, we can map the configuration to the increments of a path S in, in some suitable way. And if I define a, a, a path maximum in inverted commas in a suitable way, then I can um, define the dynamics of the path encoding in the same kind of form as, as I did for, for the box ball system. And so, sort of more generally, for the ultra discrete KDB, I need a slightly more uh, subtle version of the past maximum. So, this two time step um, average past maximum. This should be the, um, the process that I take, um, which actually for the, the box ball system just corresponds to the actual past maximum minus a half. So, kind of just differing from what I chose by a constant here. Um, more generally, for the discrete KDV system, also for the discrete KDV system, we need to replace sorry, the supremum here with 
um, a log some exponential type operation. So of course, again, for those familiar with this, then you'll see that this naturally kind of ultra discretizes to, to a supreme. And so um, it's kind of would be a natural guess as to how to, um, to move from the ultra discrete world to the discrete world here. But when we kind of make this choice, again, by choosing the path suitably, we can also define the dynamics in the same kind of way. And also for the TODA systems as well. So the, the operations become a bit horrible. And because we've got these two kinds of variables, we need to worry about odd and even sites in, in describing this. But um, essentially, then the operation is, is the same um, afterwards. So just the reflection in the past maximum. And we, well, we need a shift just to kind of line up the variables in the, the right way. So um, yeah, so this is just for the ultra discrete KDV with infinite capacity. We can also define another path maximum for the, the K capacity, a finite capacity, but um, somehow the formula becomes a bit more horrible here. So that's why I didn't write it um, up here. And so, well, here's just a, a few pictures to show what kind of things these are looking like. So, so an ultra discrete KDV picture, we have just something that's a bit like what they drew for the box ball system. More generally, this kind of discrete version will be, well, I think more generally, it's not more general, but um, yeah, for the discrete um, picture, we have this kind of uh, log sum exponential. And this is, of course, a much smoother kind of operation than, than just a supremum. And so, so it has a much more sort of kind of look as we, we see here for typical paths. And so, but yet, yet again, the, the dynamics are just simply the reflection in this, this picture. And well, we have these kind of more complicated ones for the TODA ones, which we can also easily enough um, uh, compute. Um, yeah, and so just uh, like I say, just to sort of illustrate sort of the general approach that sort of works for these other systems. So here's the kind of general story. So, so again, the starting point if you've got a carrier, so U and a configuration eta here, and the aim is to sort of change variables using some maps, maybe curly A and curly B here, to give us new variables for which we've got some conserved quantity. And just for the, the particular path encoding kind of picture that we're going to use, we, we want this conserved quantity to be A minus 2B. That's just the, what comes out of the, <coughs> the computation. And um, basically, then what we're going to do is take this a to be the increments of the path encoding. So in, in the box ball system, this was just my 1 minus 2 e to n, or more generally, I guess, j minus 2 uh, e to n. And um, the carrier is then going to be given by solving this equation. And of course, a priori, this doesn't look any more easy than solving the original carrier equation. Um, why it's kind of slightly nicer than the, the carrier equation that I wrote down before is that actually in examples, in all the examples that I, I wrote up so far, then um, we can actually solve this equation. It turns out to be kind of a natural um, functional of, of the, the past of the path. And so that's why uh, this picture turns out to be, be useful. Um, and so that's kind of the existence part of the question. So in particular, we have these kind of these formulas in which we can compute the the M and so therefore the carrier. Um, as for the uniqueness um, part of the question, I should say that this is also kind of answered by this picture. And so here's kind of, um, again, just a, a box ball configuration with a finite um, number of particles to begin with. So this is the black line shown on the bottom. So that's what's corresponding to, to, to this, this part here. But it turns out we, we could have taken other, found other carriers for this configuration that would have been consistent with, with the configuration, sorry. And we can get these by, by changing the definition of, of M here. So in, in our original definition, I just put the, the, the actual past maximum. So this is the process that's just going to come up from minus infinity here and, and go along like this. But actually, for any level K, I could define a new kind of version of the past maximum, where I just assume that at minus infinity, the past maximum is k. So I just kind of run along at level k until I intersect with the path there, and then I, I follow the, the path maximum. So that's this, this mk here. And actually, then if I just take mk minus s for this past maximum, then this solves all the equations that I need. And so this gives another version of the carrier. And in fact, these are all of the other carriers um, that are consistent with this, this configuration. 
You can kind of already see that this is maybe a bad choice because if I use this choice, then actually what the carrier is going to do is just kind of, you can see going to be this difference here between um, this orange line and the red line. And so it's just going to come down from minus infinity um, here. And so this just means that the, the carrier is kind of putting down particles all the way along down until the point it gets to, to zero here. And so in the picture, I've not only got the kind of particles that I expect to see, these kind of four original particles, but I've also got kind of an infinite string of, of particles that have been kind of introduced from minus infinity. And so kind of physical reasons, this is maybe not a very sensible choice to choose. Um, I should also say that if you do something natural from kind of infinite um, physical systems, which is to take some kind of finite volume limit. So I just kind of cut the system off at some level and define the carrier with the particles empty here, then, then the limit that you see by kind of letting the starting point go to minus infinity is, is the, the carrier that I, I, I want to take, which is just the, the actual past maximum. And so there's various physical reasons to, um, to, to use this as the actual carrier. And mathematically, why it makes sense is that actually you can see that if I use these other carriers, after I've iterated this, the dynamics for one time step, if I use these other carriers, then what the new kind of path is going to have is going to kind of also just be a reflection in this, this red line. So it's going to go off to plus infinity here, which means that the, the past maximum after one time step. So if I kind of go forwards in the dynamics by one time step, then this, then, well, this path is going to go to infinity as n goes to minus infinity. And in particular, the, the past maximum is not defined. So actually there's no carriers that we can define for this, this, this configuration that we see after one time step of the dynamics. And so in terms of the existence of solutions, actually, if we, we use these other carriers, um, then we can't solve the, 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 the equations kind of with a kind of infinite time horizon. And so that's kind of mathematically um, why there might be a bad, bad choice um, uh, of, of carriers. And so, yeah, this just kind of summarizes all that I've said so far. So basically, um, given configuration, let's suppose that <coughs> It's kind of asymptotically linear. So this is not an essential requirement, but um, um, it's, it's just kind of a useful one for simplifying the statement of the theorem. So let's suppose I've got some path encoding for let's say the box ball system here, that's kind of asymptotically linear. So the gradient is just strictly positive at plus and minus infinity. And roughly, well, what this means is just the density of the particles. So if I look at um, the number of particles, um, over n sites. So if I look at this density, then this converges to some number rho, which is in, well, let's say, naught to a half for the box ball system, or more generally j over two um, for the, the j capacity box ball system. And so this is kind of a natural density condition, which ensures that I've got more spaces than particles. And so this kind of stops the, the problem of particles rushing off to infinity or coming in from minus infinity. Um, then basically what our infinite solution is exactly what um, I've described. So namely, I just define the, the kind of iterated paths here just by applying this Pitman transformation repeatedly and I can do it forwards and backwards. So I can do this for all Z. So actually one of these boundary conditions gives the forward dynamics. So that's the minus infinity one. The plus infinity one gives the backwards dynamics. Um, and that, that defines uh, uniquely the um, the uh, lattice variables that solve the ultra discrete KDV equation with a configuration satisfying this initial um, condition. And so that's the, uh, the main result. Um, yeah, being as I've got about one minute left, so here's a picture of the kind of repeated iteration. Um, um, yeah, so I did also want to talk about invariant measures. <laughs> this was kind of the main point of my talk. Um, and so to do this, I just kind of finish off with this, which is really the, the main result. Um, in this direction. Um, and so there are two conditions to this result. So this, the first is that what I want to do is in the configuration on a particular time, I want to put a random measure. So um, in particular, I'm going to independently, according to some measure mu, choose um, um, the, 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 the state of the configuration. So in the box ball system, of course, I just have to have a Bernoulli random variable with some parameters, so namely, with probability p, I put a particle, and with probability one minus p, I, I, I don't have a particle. That's the only choice in the, the basic BBS case. Um, but more generally, I can and think of um, um, other kind of distributions to put on, on the configuration here. 
And what I want to know is exactly after one step of dynamics, um, do I have the same um, distribution? And so the first condition is that if I put particles down according to this distribution, I'm in, a, in the nice space where I have this unique global solution. And so actually what I've just shown is that as long as the, the distribution has density less than a half, then, then I'm in this world. And if I'm in that world, then to check the global invariance of the, the distribution, I just need to check the distribution is invariant locally. So namely, if, if the configuration is distributed according to some measure mu, then I can find some measure nu for the carrier such that when I kind of put it through the, the map corresponding to the lattice dynamics, then I'm going to end up with um, um, the same distribution as the output. Okay. So the, the cross here just means I want them to be independent on both the independent input and the output. And yeah, just to, as the sort of final thing I'll say, sorry, is um, this, this is kind of a classical problem to solve um, in probability theory to solve these kind of equations. And in particular, for the equations that appear in the KDV examples, we can we can solve these to get kind of exponential geometric type invariant measures, or sort of so-called generalized inverse Gaussian ones for the discrete KDV equation. And similarly, for the total equations, we have to kind of break down the, the lattice into sort of two two pieces, but we can reduce it to similar kinds of equations, and we can also solve solve these to, to find the appropriate geometric or gamma type. Um, invariant measures for these these systems. So, um, yeah, sorry, I was a little bit fast at the end there, but uh, yeah, hopefully I at least conveyed something of what we were were doing over the last couple of years um, in this direction. So, well, thank you for your attention. So, so yeah, so that's where I was going to stop. So I hope that was okay. Hello. Hey, on mute, maybe. Ah, if you're... Sorry, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, may I ask a question? Okay, yes, yeah. please. So, um, uh, Okay, so if uh, you go back to your uh, scheme about uh, the relationship of all of all the, these equations to uh, with themselves, I think it was quite at the beginning. Like this. Okay, kind of exactly thing. this one. So my mm -hmm. question is uh, how, um, and uh, it appears to be some relation from your ultra discrete and discrete part. And uh, so there is some uh, relationship between the, yeah, the yeah, between the discrete and the continuum part, because you mentioned at the beginning some results on continuous equations. So there might be connected with this uh, or somehow. Or... Yeah, so so far, um... Yeah, so so like like I mentioned, in terms of what I talked about, invariant measures. So um, recently, it was shown that actually white noise is invariant for um, uh, KDV equation, and so white noise is essentially um, just well, in a sense, a kind of infinite collection of of Gaussian random variables where each site is kind of decorrelated from the other site. So it's kind of the purest, in some sense randomness that you can get. Um, and of course, this is kind of, you can see this as some kind of limit of independent kind of discrete random variables, independent random variables on a discrete lattice. So this is um, a, a natural limit for, for the discrete um, um, IID configurations that, that we see. So yeah, so far in terms of invariant measures, I think, um, well, 
yeah, what would be a kind of very natural question would be whether we can kind of derive the white noise as an invariant for the, the KGB equation up here from the knowledge about the invariant um, of the IID configuration that I wrote down in the discrete KDB case. So, so we have a sequence of distributions. Um, there's the so-called generalized inverse gauss, it doesn't really matter what these are, but we have a sequence of kind of, if we put these kind of distributions on in an IID way, so independently for each space site, then um, it'd be kind of natural to ask in what sense can we, we derive um, white noises scaling limit um, for this system that's somehow consistent with the, the dynamics. So taking the appropriate continuous limit, can we see that invariance of white noise from this discrete picture? And so, yeah, this is certainly something that's kind of very interesting question and one that I guess would be interesting to do in the future. But yeah, so far, I think there's no work to, to do this um, rigorously, I think. So um, I don't know if that was the kind of question that you are. Yeah, yeah that, that was exactly my question. Thank you. But yeah, this answer. is certainly a very natural thing to want, yeah, yeah. want to do. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there other questions or comments? Yeah, may, may, I, may I ask a question? I'm, I'm dodging. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the, most of, uh, of your <laughs> talk. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, can you? Gave some uh, very uh, simple examples or very uh, brief introduction about uh, the some applications of ultra discrete integral systems or our uh, BBS. Do you know some examples? So, in in <laughs> in, in what sense do you want to? No, I heard about that. For example, Sasuma Sansei. Uh, he, I, I remember that he gave a talk some years ago and he mentioned some application of uh, BBS in control or industry, some industry Yeah, control. so I mean, this is a direction I'm not very familiar with. I mean, I guess like in terms of, yeah, I'm not so familiar with like the applications of ultra discrete systems. I guess in some sense, the point of the discrete ones is exactly to provide kind of um, natural discretizations of the these kind of continuous systems up here. So. One one application is of course kind of kind of numerical computation and so on to try and actually provide systems that reflect the the, the properties of these these systems up here. Um, <coughs> yeah, I guess also kind of from a kind of math physics kind of point of view. I mean, like I said at the beginning, maybe yeah, you weren't here, but um, so Takashi Satsuma they they introduce these systems to study kind of um, yeah. solitonic type systems and so. Um, I guess part of the point is that um, understanding these is much more simple than these kind of um, the, the, the original KDV equation, for example, that the soliton decomposition is, is much clearer. And um, in particular, in recent years, maybe kind of a, a concrete way in which we kind of see that um, kind of soliton decomposition being applied is to prove things like hydrodynamic limits. So this is where we're now not in equilibrium, we maybe start from some density profile of different soliton sizes, and we can derive some coupled system of equations to um, describe how these evolve. And um, somehow, yeah, so I, I believe um, it's my understanding at the moment that in these kind of higher level systems, at the moment, this kind of notion of, of generalized hydrodynamics is only really understood on the kind of level of of physics, so so kind of not rigorously mathematically, whereas exactly on the kind of box ball type level, we're, we're now starting to be able to um, understand these systems. So so this kind of results here are kind of first rigorous ones where we're we're writing down um, these kind of uh, understanding these hydrodynamic limits um, rigorously. And of course, the aim is to kind of eventually kind of build up through these systems to understand them for the discrete systems, and then eventually for the the continuous ones as, as well. And so. Um, yeah, I guess there's all kinds of different directions in which you could be um, trying to, to mm -hmm. apply kind of mm -hmm. knowledge that we're kind of uh, gaining down here, I suppose. <laughs> uh, so one more question is, uh, do, you, do you have any uh, any equation, any uh, dis ultra discrete integral systems that have uh, bi-directed solitary waves? So you mean waves moving in, in each direction? So yeah, yeah, in I mean, each I'm, direction. I'm not working in integral systems, so I I, um, I don't know if no, people already studied okay. the examples. Just, just but the actually, BBS. Yeah, but it, yeah, I was going to say for the BBS, it would surely be uh, 
Let me think. So I guess people study the, the BDS with negative um, um, masses, right? And so I guess these will be, I don't know, maybe someone who's more expert on BDS can answer this, but maybe this is one <laughs> motivation to do this. I don't know if these quantums moving with negative speed, I don't know. But uh, presumably it wouldn't be impossible to, to construct these systems if they don't already exist. I don't, yeah, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> like I say, maybe some of that's nice. <laughs> okay, okay, yes. thank you. But, uh, uh, in principle, in tau the lattice, the wave should go in both directions. So maybe mm -hmm. something is happening when you do the ultra discretization that moves mm -hmm. them to go only in one direction rather than the other. Because actually, the one, one limit, another continuum limit of Toda is to uh, Boussin esque. And mm -hmm. uh, this is another integrable system, yeah, yeah, yeah. which has, of course, uh, since it's second order equation. Uh, ways can cytons can travel in both directions, left or right. Uh, so maybe that might be another different uh, approach. I don't know. There are some discrete Boussinesques, so I don't know if uh, they can be suitable for this kind of analysis or not. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Are there any question? other questions or comments? May I ask a question? Great. Can I can I ask you one question? <laughs> so, uh, so you you said that in the case of uh, ultra discrete KDV, and mm -hmm. you cho you have chosen uh, a Bernoulli uh, distribution distribution for the mm -hmm. initial one. And how about uh, the Toda case? Yeah. So I mean, the point for the box ball system is essentially if you're looking at independent distributions, like well essentially well you've only got one choice for each location right you have zero one uh, as your kind of choice of, of states and so you have to have Bernoulli distribution in this case um more generally i should say even for the ultra discrete kdv if you kind of let's think about just the discrete case like i mean discrete state uh, variable picture so let's suppose we're really talking about bbs of course your variables live on zero up to j here and in this case you can get um a sort of geometric distributions on on this as, oh, and yeah. show these are invariant actually it kind of like was surprising to us that um it's actually a bit more complicated than that so naturally you kind of expect to see things like scaling and shifting of the distribution i mean this kind of is invariant for the for dynamics but uh yeah actually it turned out that um because of the way in which the kind of um uh, map works it also preserves somehow kind of um the parity of the um the distribution and so actually you can get kind of versions of geometric distribution whose kind of parameters between odd and even sites are different and so i mean odd, odd and uh, sorry odd and even um sort of choices of state here uh, are different depending on whether they're odd or even so that was kind of a little bit surprising to us but again that's just coming out of the particular structure of the the, the, the map as for the um that so as for the, the toda case so actually you can kind of understand it already from this this picture as to why we're going to get what we're going to get is so here's the toda so these are going to be geometric in this almost basic um case and um again you can kind of understand that because if you if you have like particles kind of in the in the BBS that are kind of each Bernoulli with parameter p, yes, here or, or states that are um, given by this distribution, then of course the kind of interval that you're talking about here, so that the length yes. of the, the interval containing particles is of course then just the geometric with parameter p, and similarly the the the, the spaces here are geometric with parameter oh, one yes, minus yes, p yes. In, in this case, of course, and so. This is why you can kind of easily understand, at least in the BBS, why these should be the kind of natural um, mm. event measures corresponding to, to those ones there. Um, is there yeah, any possibility to choose other distribution? So, of course, you can put any distribution that you want, but these are <laughs> yeah. the only invariant ones for the, oh, the yes. system. So, <laughs> if you start with, um, yeah, so, okay, so I should say that there. There are some other trivial ones. So, in the sense that, 
like again going back to the bbs if if you just have particles kind of based on sort of zero up to j here you if you have a kind of large carrier so let's suppose your carrier has capacity bigger than than j say let's suppose you only put particles some distribution that's supported on zero up to like something that's like j over two then all that's going to happen is the carrier is going to pick up all of those particles and move it onto the next site at, at, least, at each yeah. um, time step. So maybe even k just have to be bigger than j over, I oh don't know, let's say bigger than j, yeah. And so the carrier is just going to move them along. So you just get kind of trivial dynamics. For so you can put any measure you like on, on this, but it will just be shifted along. And so that's again, oh, just a not very interesting <laughs> solution to the, to the problem, but it is a solution <laughs> to the problem. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> May I ask a question? Okay, yeah. Hello. Please. May I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Yes, Hello. please. Uh, so can you construct an invariant meta corresponding corresponding to the generalized Gibbs ensemble of the PBS, which is should be non-trivial even for J1 case? Because the PBS has a higher order conserved quantities, and uh, it should be no, it shouldn't be a kind of ID type. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, I guess, the, I mean, the answer is no. But I guess the closest to this is exactly uh, like uh, the work. So let's go. Sorry. Right. Yeah, so in a sense, the, the closest this has been done in is is by uh, in, in this paper by Frari and Goyen, Rollo and Wang. So exactly, they give invariant measures um, based on on solitons, and so yeah, these aren't quite described as, as give measures. And actually, in this Frari Gabriele paper too, um, they're getting mm -hmm. towards this, and so in a sense, they're putting some kind of Gibbs measure on a excursion so so in the kind of picture of the path encoding or the carrier we have these kind of excursions here and mm -hmm. so they kind of assign to uh, of course the excursion kind of breaks down into the sort of numbers of solitons of different sizes so maybe like a collection of um so for each i you've got kind of a quantity which is the number of size i solitons something uh, like this and they essentially define a um, um, a measure that's a kind of Gibbs measure based by weighting configurations according to the kind of number of solitons within each excursion. So they select kind of excursions in an IID way. And so I, I think this is in the direction of constructing the Gibbs measure. It's not yet been done as kind of a Gibbs measure, and I don't think it's a kind of a fully general um, picture that they've constructed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is the kind of closest. Um, that we do so in particular the, the kind of weight of an excursion so like if we call this excursion e up here or something then this is going to be proportional to something like e to the minus like beta i times n i summed over all of the different um possible configurations something uh, like this and so um yeah this is kind of in that direction but yeah so far it's not been done as far as I'm, I'm aware um but yeah again it's kind of a very natural way to to construct the invariant measures um to build it from, mm. from the invariant uh, the conserved quantities that you mentioned. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments more? OK, thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. And so, uh, I think we can end this session here and I will give you appointment to the next session that would be at the end of the month on March the 25th uh, with uh, Professor Yang Di from the uh, Shanghai University, if I'm correct, uh, and uh, not sorry, from the China Technical University. And so we'll stop the recording now and I'll thank all the attendants to this uh, session. Thank you. And thank you, to, of course, to David for his very interesting talk. <laughs>